Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, webinar on power electric ceramics and thin films for applications in uncooled infrared sensors and arrays. Um, it's going to take rather longer than 15 minutes, which was the advertised time, but I hope uh, I hope you won't find it boring. Um, but I just found it was not going to be possible to cover this in 15 minutes. It's likely to take about 35 to 40 minutes altogether. So if you have to bail out, I will understand. Um, so to start with, what's this talk going to be about? So I'm going to give you a little bit of background to pyroelectrics and uh, pyroelectric materials and how they work. Um, I'll then talk about the physics of pyroelectric infrared sensors. The whole idea of this webinar series is to be a kind of tutorial series. So I'm going to go through some of the basics on how pyroelectric infrared detectors work and what makes good things and what makes bad things about them. And from that, I'll give some indications as material scientists how we should choose a power electric material for a given application. And particularly, I'll be referring to the figures of merit that are frequently used in the discussion of power electrics and, and trying to indicate how they can and can't and how they should and shouldn't be used. Um, and then I'll move on to talk about some real applications of pyroelectrics, particularly in infrared sensor arrays um, for movement sensors and particularly for thermal imaging. Um, finally, I'd like to give a few slides about ferroelectric, pyroelectric thin film materials for applications in sensors and arrays. And then we'll uh, take a few questions from the audience, and I hope you'll find this interesting and stimulating. Okay. So pyroelectric infrared detectors, we start with um, ferroelectric material. All polar dielectrics are, are, are pyroelectric. Um, so anything which both lacks uh, a center of symmetry and has a unique polar axis will give a pyroelectric effect, which is the uh, generation of an electric current when, uh, when, when heated or cooled. But ferroelectrics have the largest changes in spontaneous polarization with temperatures. So when we're talking about um, applications we want to maximize the effect, we're almost invariably talking about using ferroelectric materials in this, in this application. So if one plots the spontaneous polarization of a ferroelectric material with temperature, it goes to zero at the Curie temperature. And if you take a small change in temperature delta theta, that will give rise to a small change in spontaneous polarization, delta PS. And the gradient of that is called the pyroelectric coefficient. That is the pyroelectric effect. So it's to PS by d theta. And um, if you take your ferroelectric material and you apply an electrode to the face like that, or electrodes both faces, and you short circuit those two electrodes, when you change the temperature, you will get a current flowing due to this change in spontaneous polarization with temperature. And that we call the pyroelectric current. And the equation that determines that is very simple. It's the area of the pyroelectric material, this big A, times the pyroelectric coefficient, which is this gradient here, times the rate of change of temperature with time. And it's the rate of change of temperature with time because if you think about it, the change in polarization generates a charge. So charge flowing with time is current. So you have to change the temperature of, pyroelectric, of the pyroelectric to get a useful current out of it. And that's, that's a really, really important thing to, to bear in mind throughout this talk. You, you don't change, pyroelectrics do not sense absolute temperature. They sense changes in temperature. And that has both its advantages, and I think there are many advantages, but, but also one or two disadvantages, but we'll talk mainly about the advantages. Okay, so what do pyroelectric detectors actually physically look like? And these are some simple, what are called single element pyroelectric detectors. This is in a small TO5 transistor can, and we have, a, in this particular case, it's a one by one millimeter thin chip of, of a pyroelectric ceramic and uh, it goes behind a window, and the infrared radiation is allowed to fall on it. And I'll explain these other components inside the package in a minute, but you typically will have a bias resistor and a field effect transistor, and that forms your, your detector. They're very simple, 
And they have um, many advantages over other, other forms of radiation detector. First of all, they will detect any wavelength of radiation. All you have to do is to allow the radiation to fall on the material and be absorbed and give you a temperature change. So they are wavelength insensitive. They work at room temperature. They don't require cooling. Um, they're very high in sensitivity and uh, better than almost all other uncooled infrared detectors. Um, they integrate the signal, which can be an advantage, and um, they're what I would call AC coupled to the radiation flux. That means they only detect changes in radiation flux with time. That's because of this requirement to change the element temperature with time to get current. And they're very widely used. Uh, they're very widely used in, in people sensing or indeed occupancy sensing so that if you have um, detectors in your laboratory that uh, turn the lights automatically on when you come into the lab in the morning, that will be uh, almost invariably a pyroelectric infrared detector that's doing that for you. It'll be in the ceiling. And what it's doing is when you come into the room, it's sensing the radiation from your body falls on this, this sensitive element that looks something like that. And the element temperature will change by something like one-tenth of one millionth of a Kelvin. So that is the kind of temperature change that you're sensing with a pyroelectric detector. They are amazingly sensitive. Um, they're used in spectrometry. The wavelength and sensitivity is very, 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 very useful in that sense. And many high-end uh, Fourier transform infrared spectrometers use pyroelectric detectors as the sensors. Um, they're used in flame and fire sensing for obvious reasons. You can detect the radiation from fire. They're used in environmental monitors for uh, sensing particular types of gases. They're used in energy management systems. And as I'll give you some examples, they're used in, in thermal imaging. Okay, so let's talk a little about, a bit about the physics of pyroelectric to infrared detectors and how they work. So we go back to our little chip of our pyroelectric material here, which is typically very thin. So we have a thickness here, D. And we allow radiation to fall on this. And we'll, for the sake of a model, we'll say this is sinusoidally modulated. So we have a, a power, which varies with time, by this expression, e to the i omega t, uh, with a w naught constant there. And... Um, the radiation is absorbed, it changes the temperature of the detector, so that the, the, the detector pixel has a heat capacity, which is very simply given by the volume specific heat times the volume, which is the, the area times the thickness, that should be D, not T. And um, the heat flows out to the environment through some thermal conductance, which we call GT. And we set the temperature difference between the element and, uh, and its surroundings as theta. And so what we want to do to calculate the pyroelectric current, we need to work out the rate of change of temperature with time, which is d theta by dt or theta dot here. And to do that, we use a simple conservation of energy equation and we write the power input to the element is equal to the power retained plus the power lost. Well, the power input to the element is this W of T, which we multiply by the emissivity of the electrode, and we try and make that as close to one as possible. Um, the power retained is the heat capacity element times the rate of change of temperature, uh, temperature with time, and the power lost is the thermal conductance times the temperature difference between the element and its surroundings. So it's a very, very simple equation. And um, we can solve that differential equation with this solution, which is theta equals uh, eta times W naught divided by the thermal conductance times J omega times the heat capacity e to the I, e to the J omega T. So that's, that's the solution for theta. So what we can do now is we can take that and we can differentiate it and we can plug it into the equation for the pyroelectric current and this is what we get. So we get the pyroelectric current is the pyroelectric coefficient, which as you'll remember is the gradient of the spontaneous polarization with temperature times the area times theta dot and that is the answer to that differential equation. So we get... Uh, the pyroelectric coefficient, eta here, the emissivity, times the area, times the frequency, the angular frequency, 
and then we have the thermal conductance here. And now we've placed the thermal time constant here at the bottom, which is uh, tau t. And um, we can very simply plot that equation. So we plot log of IP against log of the angular frequency. We get something that rolls off at low frequency as one upon omega and is more or less flat. Uh, of frequencies above one upon angular frequencies, one above tau t, and that is a very simple uh, equation, uh, very simple of the form for the pyroelectric current. So, if we divide the pyroelectric current by the W naught here, we get what's known as as the current responsivity, which is measured in amps per watt of input, and then that is simply the eta times p over the area times the thermal capacity. And, um, I need to get rid of that, that's fine. And um, that then breaks down into two factors. One is a pair of parameters which are dependent upon the device design, which is the emissivity divided by the thickness. And these two parameters, which are materials dependent. So as material scientists, I guess we'd say we're more interested in this than this. But of course, if we're device designers, we have to be interested in everything. So the pyroelectric coefficient divided by the volume specific heat, which is very simple. And it's quite makes sense because the bigger the pyroelectric coefficient, the more current you're going to get out. But if you think about it, if the volume specific heat is higher, we need more energy to give us a, a given change in temperature, so a higher volume specific heat will push the current responsivity down. So that's very simple. So how would, do we then um, derive the performance of a real type of device? Well, most, but not all, but I say most pyroelectric detectors are actually voltage detectors. They have a, a voltage amplifier associated with them. Um, there are also, it's also possible to do it with a current amplifier, but I won't go into that in this talk. So the very simplest type of, of amplifier is simply a field effect transistor. And we use a field effect transistor because it has a very high input impedance. And this, as it's configured, is a simple unity gain amplifier. So what happens is the pyroelectric current here is generated by the pyroelectric element, element due to the input radiation power. The pyroelectric current, which we show by this little sign here, flows through a gate bias resistor here, which we call RG. And it generates a voltage which modulates the voltage on this gate and that then gives you a voltage output. So it's a very, very simple device. And the, the different parameters which determine the performance of this device are, the comp are the, both the electri electrical components that you see here, but also the thermal components comprising the thermal capacity of the element and the thermal conductance to the environment. So in order to work out the voltage, we first have to think about what this pyroelectric current is doing. Well, it's flowing through, it's an AC voltage, it's an AC current, sorry, which is flowing through an AC impedance or an AC admittance. So we have to think about the complex admittance that's presented to the pyroelectric current, and that's given by this factor Y, and it's simply the these two admittances in parallel, so they sum. So we've got J omega C, and C is the sum of the pixel capacitance CE plus CA, which are in parallel. And RG is this impedance, this effectively uh, an AC resistance, right? Um, but it can be as simple as a gate bias resistor, maybe 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 ohms connected in parallel with the pyroelectric element. Okay, so the pyroelectric voltage is then the pyroelectric current divided by the admittance. And if we put those together, we get this equation, which looks a little bit complicated. So the response, the voltage responsivity is given by the pyroelectric voltage divided by the power. And that's the pyroelectric current divided by the admittance times the power. And if we put these factors in for the admittance, what we end up with is this equation here. So we now have, as opposed to the pyroelectric current, which only had one time constant, which was the thermal time constant, we now have two time constants involved in this equation. There's a thermal time constant 
and an electrical time constant. So the thermal time constant, which we saw before, is the thermal capacity divided by the thermal conductance, and the electrical time constant is the resistance here times the total capacity plus Ca. Okay. So if we plot that as a function of uh, angular frequency, we get a, a curve that looks something like this. So it rolls off as one over F as low frequencies, which is just what power electric current did. But now we see something that rolls off as one over omega or one over F at high frequencies as well. And these two frequencies here, these two angular frequencies are determined by the uh, thermal time constant and the electrical time constant. So there's a very nice symmetry about this and the uh, responsivity maximizes at the, geo at the square root of the geometric mean of these two. Okay. So this RV max, you can show simple algebra that it's given by um, the gate bias resistor divided by the thermal conductance times two, these two time constants. And here we have the pyroelectric coefficient in the area coming in. And at these two points, at these two time constant points, right, one over tau t and one over tau, tau e, then um, to the minus one, then we have these thermal, this responsivity t, which is R V max divided by root two. And actually, and in, log, in log terms, as we'll see in a minute, there is not very much difference between them. This is almost flat between these two on a log scale. At high frequencies, we can show that the response is given by the emissivity times the power electric coefficient divided by C prime, the volume specific heat, times the thickness, and here we have these two capacitances coming in times the angular frequency. So we see this rolling off as one upon omega. And if the element capacitance CE is much bigger than CA, so if we have a much bigger uh, power electric pixel capacitance and the amplifier capacitance, then we can simply write that the, um, the uh, element capacitance is epsilon epsilon naught A over D, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. And when we substitute, if we neglect CA and substitute that into there, then we get this, this interesting equation here, which is also important. So we have, again, the emissivity, pyroelectric coefficient divided by the volume specific heat times epsilon epsilon naught and if you like they are the materials parameters here p c prime and epsilon and the device dependent parameter here now is the area and not the and not the thickness as it was with the uh, current uh, responsivity okay so if we actually plot that for a real device structure, which is what we see here, then, then it's a bit different from the, the schematic I showed on the earlier slide. So you have a, a very clear one over F roll off or one over omega roll off at low frequencies and one over F at high frequencies. And between these two frequencies determined by the electrical and the thermal time constants, and actually these can swap around. Um, you can't electrically tell which one is which, then you have an almost flat um, voltage responsivity, which is actually quite nice. Um, okay, so we've talked about signal, whether you're talking about a pyroelectric current signal or, or a pyroelectric voltage signal. But of course, for infrared detectors, we have to think about not just the signal, but also the noise. And there are two descriptions of signal-to-noise which are used with all radiation detectors. So the first is the noise, what's called the noise-equivalent power. So this would be the power of a, an RMS, routing square, signal required to give you a response which is equal to the total RMS noise voltage, so which we call delta Vm. So we call the noise-equivalent power the NEP, so you might see that written in papers when you're looking at, uh, looking at papers on infrared detectors. And that's simply given by the RMS noise divided by the RMS voltage responsivity. And very often, even more often than NEP, you see all the specific detectivity. So a lot of people a bit are are a bit uncomfortable with a, a figure of merit which gets lower as the device gets better 
which is this does, and they like something which improves as the device gets better. So they take one upon the NEP and then they, they normalize it to effectively the linear dimensions of the, the device, in other words, the square root of the area. So specific detectivity is, is the, the most often used uh, figure of Maritor, which describes the performance of a, an infrared detector. So in order to uh, determine um, the performance, the signal-to-noise performance of a pyroelectric infra infrared detector, we have to look at the noise sources. And there are several noise sources in this type of device. Now, the first is there's noise in the incident radiation power, which is associated actually with the absorption and loss of heat, uh, the absorption of heat from the radiation and the loss of heat to the environment. Um, there is what's called uh, Johnson noise, and there's several sources of Johnson noise in, in the device, but the most important one is the fact that the capacitor here has, um, has a real component to it. In other words, it has dielectric loss, and that makes it look like a, an AC resistor, and that Johnson noise in the AC impedance is called delta IJ. So we re represent that as a, a Johnson noise current here. Um, we also have to think about the AC impedance, which is presented to the amplifier, which we'll call here G to the minus one. The amplifier itself is noisy, and there are two sources of noise. There's current noise, which is called delta IA, and there's voltage noise, delta EA. And we have to take account of all these noise sources uh, when we think about the signal-to-noise performance of a power electric device. Okay, so we can represent those current noises as equivalent voltages by effectively looking at the uh, impedance or the admittance that is presented to the current by the, by the total circuit. And we look at, look at each of them in turn. The first is the thermal, what's called the thermal fluctuation noise, or delta WT, and that is effectively the, the shot noise of phonons which are flowing in, into and out of the pyroelectric element. And there's an expression for that. It's 4K, where K is Boltzmann's constant. This is the absolute temperature squared, and this is the thermal conductance to the environment. And um, Effectively, you can then derive from that a voltage noise source. If we have a, a fluctuation in, in temperature in, or in power, we can put that through the equation for RV. So that's the RV there. And we can derive a D star from that, a detectivity. And that actually gives us the fundamental limit for the sensitivity of a pyroelectric device, which is around about 2 times 10 to the 10 in these rather strange units, if you haven't seen them before, which are centimeters hertz to the root hertz per watt. So that's the units for de detectivity. We won't go into that now, but this two times 10 to the 10 is, is if you like the fundamental limit of detectivity for a power electric device. I have to say that no commercial devices get close to that. Um, the most commercial devices would be about two orders of magnitude worse than this fundamental limit. But there are some specialist devices which you've got up in the low 10 to the nines, which would be about a factor of 10 worse than that. And there is promise perhaps for getting even better. Um, so one of the most important noises in this type of device is the AC Johnson noise, delta VJ. And that is uh, given the current for that is 4KT times G, where G is the AC, MP, AC conductance of the pyroelectric element. And if you go through the maths, you can show that that is given by 4KT tan delta over the capacitance element to the half, omega to the minus a half, right? So that's it. I won't go through the derivation of that. We haven't got time. And then the component dependent noises, delta VI and delta VA, <clears throat> you have to derive, get those from the data sheet for the amplifier. And obviously, the engineers would choose as low a noise amplifier as they can find from the catalogs. But on the whole, you will find that uh, junction FETs are quieter than MOSFETs. 
but MOSFETs are more readily available. And so you tend to find that single element detectors would use junction FETs, whereas arrays would tend to use MOSFETs because they're more easily integrated. So how do those noise sources, how do all these noise sources look in comparison to each other? So I put a schematic diagram here which plots the typical noise sources for a pyroelectric device. Um, so the, uh, the thermal noise here, okay, which you can see is a, a order of magnitude lower than the total noise. The amplifier noise um, is usually uh, current noise is, sorry, the voltage noise is usually pretty low. The current noise here usually dominates at, um, at high frequencies, but at low frequency, sorry, usually dominates at low frequencies. At high frequencies, we're usually dominated by this AC Johnson noise. So typically above about 20 to 50 hertz, the total noise will be dominated by the AC conductance represented by the tan delta loss in the element itself. So if we assume that Johnson noise is the limiting factor, then we can actually put that into our expression for signal to noise using the responsivity equation that I derived earlier. And if you go through the maths again, what you get is this expression here, which, which looks a bit complicated. So it's worth sort of breaking it down into different factors. So the first are the device dependent parameters, as we did before. And here we find the detectivity now for a voltage mode device is proportional to the, the device thickness. So that's interesting. Um, and it's kind of what you'd expect. If the device is thicker, you're going to get more volts out of it because the capacitance is a bit lower. The materials dependent parameters are here. So we have P divided by C prime, the volume specific heat. And here now we have the permittivity and the loss coming in together inside this square root sign here. And then finally, the whole thing rolls off as one upon the square root of the frequency now. So we've now seen three sets of, if you like, performance parameters for the device. We had the current responsivity, which was proportional to the the power electric coefficient divided by C prime times epsilon epsilon ors. And now we have the signal to noise figure of merit, which is proportional to P divided by this expression here. And in fact, we can, we can bring those together into these very popular pyroelectric materials figures of merit, which you will see very widely in the literature on pyroelectrics. So the first is for the voltage responsivity. Now we have to remember that this is really only valid if the capacitance of the element is much bigger than the capacitance of the amplifier. And that's important. And it's only valid for frequencies which are much bigger than tau e to the, that should, there should be a minus one sign here, but it's much bigger than tau e to the minus one. If the amplifier capacitance is bigger than the element capacitance, then actually the figure of merit to use ignores the permittivity here, it's simply P over C prime. So that we would refer to as the current figure of merit. And then the specific detectivity figure of merit FD is P divided by C prime times the square root of epsilon, epsilon tan delta. And those are the three figures of merit you will see often quoted in the literature. But you need to look at them with what I would call a, a pinch of salt because there are some important points. They're rules of thumb. They can only apply in very specific circumstances. The first is the frequency range, which we see specified here, and when a particular noise source dominates in the case of the specific detectivity, which is in this case the Johnson noise. And the second is that when you're reading these papers on pyroelectrics, you have to bear in mind that it's very important that the properties should be measured at an appropriate frequency. Pyroelectrics are best operated in a frequency range 0.1 to 100 hertz because that's where that flat frequency response typically happens. It's no good, therefore, measuring a dielectric constant and a dielectric loss at a kilohertz because typically the loss tangent is going to be lower at a kilohertz that will be at, say, 50 hertz. And also the dielectric constant might be, might be significantly different as well. So these are important things to remember. And if you're working on pyroelectrics, 
it's important to remember that when you, you, you publish papers on it. So let's talk about some real pyroelectric materials now. So as I said, all polar dielectrics, all ferroelectrics are pyroelectric. How are we going to choose which one's suitable for which application? So these are three different types of pyroelectric material, which are widely used. This is a boule of lithium tantalate. This is a piece of polyvinylidene fluoride polymer. This is a piece of a pyroelectric ceramic, and uh, this is a polished wafer from that, that boule of ceramic. So, you know, they're all very different in character. How, how do we choose what to use? So we can use those figures of merit for a start. And um, here we see listed several different types of pyroelectric material. Triglycine sulfate, which is used as a single crystal material. Um, typically, in it's either deuterated form or doped with something like uh, uh, alanine. And um, you can see the pyroelectric coefficient here. It measured in microcoulombs per square meter per Kelvin. Now, in if you've not come across pyroelectrics before, 550 is a big number. It's, it, triglycine sulfate is a, is a very good material. DTGS is a very good pyroelectric. It does have some problems associated with it, which I'll come on to. Um, it also has a reasonably low dielectric constant, dielectric losses sort of average. Um, you'll see here that the volume specific heats are all in the range two and a half to three. That's normal. Um, what, when one's using these materials, you have to bear in mind what's the Curie temperature. So deuterated triglycine sulfate is about 60 degrees C. That's going to be an issue if you're working with an environment which might get close to or above that temperature because you're going to depole the material. But you can see as a, as a sort of benchmark, DTGS has an FV of 0.6 and an FD of 8.3 in, in these units here. And it's a very good material, but it's, it's water soluble. It tends to be a bit water sensitive. Um, it's quite hard to handle. And so devices make, you can certainly buy triglycine sulfate based devices, but they're expensive and they're generally only used in very high end systems, uh, typically things like uh, Fourier transport infrared, uh, infrared spectrometers. Lithium tantalate, on the other hand, you can see has a very high Curie temperature, over 660 degrees C, um, has a moderate pyroelectric coefficient, very, very low dielectric loss, which means that its FD is extremely high because the dielectric loss appears in square root form on the bottom of that equation. So, you know, if you're purely interested in signal-to-noise ratio, lithium tantalate is a really good material and is very widely used in commercial uh, commercial devices. Um, I put this in as a single crystal material. It's strontium. Uh, it's a tungsten bronze material, SBN. Um, you very difficult to get commercially, but it does have quite interesting pyroelectric materials. I put this in it primarily because. It was one of the earlier materials to be studied, and it was published by Alistair Glass um, back in the 1967, 68. Um, and uh, Alistair Glass, you pro many of you will, will, will have heard of and from the book Lines and Glass, and he's an old friend of mine. Um, a typical modified lead zirconate type A ceramic would look like this. So you have a pyroelectric coefficient, which again is intermediate between lithium tantalate and triglycine sulfate, but with a much higher dielectric constant. But typically you can engineer these materials to have quite low uh, dielectric losses. So actually the FDs are, are really not bad. The FVs are not so great, um, but not too bad. And then PVDF, which is occasionally used, has a very low pyroelectric coefficient, but also a very low permittivity, which means that it's, um, it, its voltage figure of merit isn't bad. But again, it's a polymer and therefore can be used in, in interesting ways. So th those, that's why I put these particular materials up. But there are many, many different pyroelectric materials out there. So what's interesting to think about is if you look at a real device, is what happens when you model these materials into real device structures? So I've chosen two types of devices, one with quite a large area, so this would be a 10 by 10 millimeter square detector, and that's really quite a big detector. Most would be two, two millimeters square-ish. So here you see triglycine sulfate, 
is is way way above the other materials lithium tantalate would be next SBN after that and the uh, PVDF and modified lead zirconate are uh, somewhere down here and you can see here you know you can get performances up in the high 10 to the 8 in terms of D star which which are pretty good but nowhere near the theoretical maximum that could be achieved on the other hand if you come down to a very small area detector so this would be something like 100 micron square the, the picture changes completely um, so a material like SBN would now look very very good because uh, here the you're more interested in the amount of pyroelectric signal you're getting the current you're getting and because SBN has a high pyroelectric coefficient it tends to come out on top but it, Whereas TGS is now similar to lead zirconate, modified lead zirconate in this case, and lithium tantalate is, is worse than either of those, and PVDF is way down. So I'm just putting those two graphs up to illustrate the fact that, the, that it's okay to look at figures of merit, but really you have to look at the details of the device design if you want to fully understand what's going to work best in a given application. And this um, tends to come out particularly when you talk about sensor arrays, which I'm going to be talking about now in some detail. So if you want to make a, um, a large area detector with lots of pixels in it, then you have to have a, some sort of multiplexer chip which contains all your amplifiers, and you're going to interface to that an array of ceramics, which could array of elements which could be on a ceramic or it could be perhaps on a single crystal material. And you have to have that interface through some conducting bumps. Uh, so each pixel is connected to an amplifier. And then that would be, those signals would be multiplexed onto the, um, to, to form a, a picture. So you then focus an infrared scene onto that using a germanium lens. And so that shows, say, a, a hotspot being focused onto one element. Now, in the absence of a, a, a means of modulating that radiation, that would just give you a constant infrared flux, and that gives you a constant pyroelectric temperature, and so you get no signal. And so non-chopped arrays would only see moving warm or cold objects. They see moving, moving objects in the scene. They don't see static objects. Now, that can be advantageous, as we'll see in a minute. So you'd see something moving from point to point like that. If you want to image static objects, then you have to put a chopper blade rotating between the lens and the detector, and you can do that, and it's not difficult to do it, um, but that's how you have to do it if you want to make a, a thermal imager. Um, I'll skip over this slide. Basically, what this is saying is that if you, it's really another illustration of how the, how the figures of merit are problematic when it comes to choosing a material for, say, an array like that. Because you have to look at the full structure of the device. You have to look at the thermal structure and the electrical structure. The thermal structure is going to be dictated by the readout integrated circuit because you're going to, you can only make devices, say, 10 to 15 millimeters big. Uh, ICs, otherwise they get ridiculously expensive, which means that if you want to have a, a sizable number of elements in the array, they have to be quite small, typically 100 microns or, that, or lower. Your thermal structure is usually debated by, uh, dictated by the way the device is connected, so you'd have, say, metal bumps, which give you a fixed thermal conductance, typically 10 to 20 microwatts per Kelvin. So for a 50 hertz frame rate, which would give you a thermal time constant in the 20 millisecond range, um, that means that you have, it, it actually means you have to have a, uh, an element which is about 25 microns thick. So going thinner doesn't give you any, any advantage than that, over that. So that then dictates your um, capacitance, because if you want to match the amplifier capacitance, which is typically around about a picofarad, you're going to need a permittivity of around about 400, or if you have an even smaller element, even higher permittivity. So higher, all this is saying is that high, higher permittivities can be advantageous and indeed essential if you're dealing with arrays of very small elements. So these are some pyroelectric ceramics, which um, from the literature I was involved in developing some of them, 
and you've got pyroelectric coefficients that this is about 400 microwatts per, uh, per square meter per Kelvin. And you can see the figures of merit here. You find that most of the pyroelectric ceramics based on PZT are all going to be in this ballpark for their figures of merit. Okay, so I'll give you some examples of real devices now. So this, this was a, a pyroelectric thermal imaging array that was developed at GC Marconi about 25, 30 years ago. And it used a modified lead zirconate pyroelectric ceramic, which is interfaced to a a CMOS reader integrates the processing technology. The two were put together using flip chip solder bonding. So a cross section would look like this. So there's your silicon IC, your pyroelectric ceramic element, which is about 40 to 50 microns thick, and your individual solder bumps there. And uh, a typical package pyroelectric array would look something like that. Okay. And uh, indeed, this particular array is, is a 16 by 16 element array, which was developed by a company called Irisys in Northampton in the UK. And it just has uh, 256 elements in the array. And you, that was put into a system for looking at uh, people moving around in, in shopping malls, as they used to before COVID-19 struck. And um, so you'd have these things looking down from the ceiling, just and what the array sees as people move underneath. So the visible image on the right, the infrared image on the left. And uh, what this is doing is, is it's counting people moving backwards and forwards, for example, into a store. And indeed that uh, was, it, was engineered into a supermarket checkout uh, queue counter system. So we're gonna see this working here. So we have our array staring down from the ceiling at this scene, and you can see there's a lady in the checkout queue here, somebody walks by, but all the array sees is these warm blobs and cold blobs as people are moving around. But that's all the system needs in order to be able to tell how many people are in each checkout queue. And what this enables then is for the checkout captain, the manager of the store to say, okay, if we're, we're gonna manage this store to only have an average of one person in front in the queue, then uh, we will either need to close a, open a checkout, or perhaps we can, we're not so busy, we can close one off and the staff can be doing something else. Um, if you have more elements in the array, then you can uh, actually make thermal images. And this was a, a firefighting imager that used a 100 by 100 array. Uh, so this was a solid state system that mounted on the side of a firefighting camera. And long wavelength infrared working in the 8 to 12 micron band uh, penetrates smoke very well. So this is a, a, a burning room. So this is a, first of all a visible image. So first of all you see what a firefighter would see without a thermal imager. And then we'll switch over to a thermal image in a minute. And this is what the firefighter sees with this 100 by 100 ray. So not a fantastic image. There are better images on the market now than this one but you can see enough to find your way around a burning building. And in this particular case, these are, I have to, has, I have to emphasize these were just dummies. This was a training video. So the firefighter was easily able to, um, to rescue, the, rescue the child. Okay. Okay, so, so far I've only talked about uh, bulk pyroelectric materials, but um, I'd now like to say a few words about pyroelectric thin films because there's been a lot of work on this. Um, ferroelectric thin films, they can be grown directly onto silicon now. Uh, they can be made in large area at low cost. They give low thermal mass. And if you make them right, you get good thermal isolation. So there are two ways of doing this. One is via bulk micromachining, where you have a PZT thin film on a silicon membrane. So you grow your PZT directly on a silicon wafer, and then you etch a cavity away from underneath using either a wet chemical or a dry chemical etching process to give you good thermal isolation. Or you can think about surface micromachining, where you would have your silicon substrate here. Again, you grow your pyroelectric material, your PZT directly on the surface, but now you'd have a sacrificial layer under the, under the pyroelectric, which you chemically machine out. And in this case, you could make that, say, onto an active silicon chip. But to do that onto an active silicon chip, you would need to have a a very low deposition temperature, typically less than 
550 degrees C for survival of the silicon metal, the aluminium silicon metallization on the chip. So, pyroelectric thin films, PZTs, particularly, have been grown by a wide range of techniques chemical solution deposition, pulse laser deposition, sputtering. And um, these are some examples taken from the literature. And I won't go through these in detail, but you can see the pyroelectric coefficients for these, well, they're all around about the PZT. 25% zirconium, 76%, 75% titanium. But however you grow them, if you grow them right, <clears throat> you're going to get pyroelectric coefficients, which are in the two to 300 microcoulombs per square meter per Kelvin range. And so the dielectric properties are similar, 250 to 350. And so the figures of merit you would, you would see here. And um, you know, a typical, PZT thin film grown on silicon cross section would look something like this. If you grow the material correctly, you tend to get um, a sort of quasi epitaxial growth. So, this is a strongly 111 growth onto a 111 platinum electrode. And uh, this was grown at uh, Cranfield um, several years ago now using Sol Gel, but similar films have been grown by PLD and by, P uh, by, uh, by RF magnetron sputtering. And um, you can play around with the doping. And this is, uh, shows the effect of <clears throat> manganese doping on some sol gel films. And what we see here, these were measured at low frequencies, as I indicated before. So 1% manganese here pushed the dielectric constant down, which is a good thing from a pyroelectric point of view, and also reduced the dielectric loss. And so you found in this particular case that the manganese doping gave a dielectric um, figure of merit, pyroelectric figure of merit in this case, which was rather similar to what you can get from a bulk uh, bulk PZT material, a good bulk PZT pyroelectric. There are now company, there is now a company, I have to say, making uh, pyroelectric devices commercially based on uh, PZT thin films. This is Pyraeus in uh, Edinburgh uh, in the UK. And um, it was spun out of Siemens using a process that was originally developed by Rainer Brookhouse in uh, Siemens in the mid 1990s. Um, but they make a range of pyroelectric devices ranging from single element to multi element detectors for applications such as um, spectrometry and for um, fire and flame detection and for, uh, again, for the sensing of people's movements like hand movement detectors. And this is just a slide I'd like to end with. It is perfectly possible to make fully integrated um, large area arrays using PZT on silicon. This was work that was done uh, in the mid-1990s at uh, BA Systems. This was a 256 by 128 array using the thin film PZT that we developed there at Caswell. And um, these show here on the left the micro-machined PZT individual elements on the silicon. And this shows a, a thermal image that was generated using that device. And you could detect temperature differences of around about 0.1 of a Kelvin or 100 millikelvin using that device, although it never went commercial. Okay, to summarize then, uh, the pyroelectric effect is well established in a host of products for infrared sensing. I did try to find out some market figures. It's quite difficult to find them, but you're talking about world markets for infrared uh, detection these days up in the um, hundreds of millions of dollars per annum and growing at a rate of about 10 percent per annum. Um, there's a wide range of pyroelectric materials available and I've tried to give you an indication of the physics that's involved in enabling us to choose the right material for the right application. Um, pyroelectric arrays offer, offer excellent capabilities especially for people sensing um, you can control pyroelectric ceramics quite nicely, just as you can with piezoelectric PZT. You can control the properties through doping, and that can give great advantages when you're actually making arrays. Um, I've shown how directly deposited pyroelectric thin films can give us some new directions for device development based on MEMS technologies. And um, it is possible to make PZT thin films with pyroelectric properties, which are equivalent to the bulk, which, I'm not quite sure, but it's probably not quite true yet with the uh, piezoelectric thin films. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm sorry about the um, 
the blue screening in the middle and the break, but uh, I'll be happy to take any questions.